I want to say hello and welcome. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, we've been really overwhelmed by the level of interest in the talk and uh, I can see that we have people from uh, far and wide attending. Um, an online event of this size is new territory for us. So we very much appreciate your participation and your patience with any logistical hiccups we might encounter this evening. My name is Catherine Oakley and I am the Executive Director of the Roundtree Society. I'll begin with some brief background to this event. For those of you who don't know us, the Roundtree Society is a small educational charity based in York and our mission is to build and share knowledge about the histories and legacies of the Roundtree family, the Roundtree company and the Joseph Roundtree Trusts and their continuing relevance to, um, uh, to contemporary challenges. Our work is enabled by joint funding from the three Joseph Roundtree Trusts, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust and the Joseph Roundtree Reform Trust. Tonight's event is part of an ongoing project to explore the colonial context of the Roundtree Company's growth and histories of enslavement, forced labour and racial injustice, which have not been included in public understanding and presentation of Roundtree histories to date, including our own. In 1904, Joseph Roundtree endowed the three Joseph Roundtree Trusts with shares in the chocolate business. And in 2021, we issued a statement alongside statements from the three Roundtree Trusts on this, which you can read on our website if you haven't already done so. Um, we'll share a link to that, to that statement at the end of the session. Those of you who are familiar with the statement we released in 2021 and those that the Trusts released alongside it will have seen that the Roundtree Company expanded globally through the political economy of the British Empire across a period of over 150 years. The stories of Roundtree and colonialism therefore have a very broad scope, encompassing histories of the Caribbean, West Africa and South Africa. Our work with the Trusts to plan for further historical research is ongoing. However, in addition to this joint work with the Trusts, we also have our own programme of research and engagement on Roundtree colonial histories here at the Roundtree Society. Tonight is the first event in that series and I'll share details of forthcoming work just before we close. So I'm delighted tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Emma Robertson. Emma is Associate Professor in History at La Trobe University, Australia, and her research focuses on gender, labour and cultural histories of Britain and the British Empire. Emma was raised in York, where members of her family worked at the Roundtree factory on Haxby Road. She completed her PhD at the University of York in the 2000s, and her research into the complex histories of gender, race, Labour and imperialism in relation to the Roundtree Company became the basis of her 2009 book, Chocolate, Women and Empire. This book remains the sole extended study of Roundtrees in the context of colonialism. In the introduction to her book, Emma writes, growing up, I have come to understand the chocolate industry as a source of employment, of paternalistic philanthropy, and as a focus for local pride. I had seldom given thought to the origins of the cocoa used in Roundtree chocolate or to the lives of cocoa farmers. In a city in which history, or at least a palatable version of it, has become a scalable commodity, the histories of colonial relations are tellingly absent. Emma is now working on a new book project which will explore the corporate histories and legacies of English confectionery companies, including Roundtrees and Terry's. I've been hoping to find an opportunity to collaborate with Emma for some time now uh, and to overcome the time difference between Australia and the UK in order to do so. So I'm thrilled that she's able to speak tonight from here in York, where she's been on research leave uh, and indeed is heading back to Australia in just a few days time. Uh, so welcome, Emma, and over to you. Great, thank you so much, Kat. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I'm just going to try and share my screen and keep everything um, crossed uh, so that I can see what's going on. 
So hopefully you can see me. I've kind of got various devices where people can tell me if um, you can't hear me and see me. I, it's very strange not to be able to see everybody here, um, but it is a pleasure to be here virtually at a Roundtree Society event. Um, normally, as Kat said, I'm away in a very distant time zone. Uh, so I'm very feeling very lucky to be back here in my hometown of York today and uh, here for a few more days until I return to um, beautiful Jara country uh, in Victoria in the home, my new hometown of uh, Bendigo. So today I am really reflecting back on my postgraduate research which is now scarily 20 years ago um, at, which I completed at the University of York and I, I'll talk a bit about the unexpected journey that that took me on. Um, it's been interesting to revisit this research, although I feel a little bit rusty, uh, I confess about it now, but it's been interesting to revisit that research in the light of really the shifting ground um, around recognising the legacies of um, British colonialism in British society and in, in the light of um, ongoing discussions with, with Cat Oakley and people at the Roundtree Society about future directions for research, which I think is really exciting and hopefully something that we might come back to at the end. Hey, the PowerPoint is working, or it seems to be. Fingers crossed for everybody else. Um, so where Roald Dahl's Charlie Bucket had uh, Willy Wonka's factory, I had Rantries and Terry's. Where Charlie had Wonka bars, I had um, Kit Kats and Smarties and fruit pastels uh, and matchmakers and a chocolate orange at Christmas time. I was born and, and grew up in York and I passed the round trees and Terry's factories pretty much every week. Um, I could certainly smell them more often than that. Um, and the not so subtle influence of chocolate, I think, can be seen here uh, in this picture of my own fancy dress costume from the 1980s. Not, uh, in this case, a York uh, product, but one that I could conveniently tie into the Olympics that was happening at that time. Um, and luckily for me, it was still marathon at that point, not Snickers. This was also an industry alongside the railways that had provided substantial employment for my family, for my grandmother, for uncles, for aunties, and even very briefly uh, for my own mother in the post department. And it had the very happy consequence of keeping family cupboards stocked with Rantries, delicious Rantries chocolates. But it wasn't necessarily an industry that I'd given all that much thought to um, until I returned to York for my postgraduate studies as an MA student at the Centre for Women's Studies. Um, Roundtrees had really just been a name that I had associated with my school, um, with the local park and with employment, but I hadn't really any clue about the company itself or about its workers. I'd benefited from the economic and social and cultural legacies of the Roundtree factory in the city, but I really didn't know much about what went on inside that factory let alone where key ingredients um, were being grown and were coming from. Given how many of the women of my own family had worked inside those factory walls, I decided, um, inspired by the women's studies program that I was studying at the time, I decided to do some more research around women's working lives. And the oral histories that I collected for that project were the starting point of my ongoing interest in women's labour history in the social and cultural context of the British Empire and its aftermath. So as I said, I, I want to reflect today really just on my research journey, um, what that meant uh, as I progressed from my master's into what became my PhD project and how my focus shifted from a purely local study um, to, to a study of chocolate production and consumption is really grounded in global colonial and then post-colonial um, commodity change. So I wasn't sure how much, I feel like a Roundtree Society audience, you probably don't need an introduction um, from me to Roundtrees, but just in case there are um, new people here who might be new uh, new to this uh, these events. Um, like many of the British Quaker owned confectionery firms, the Roundtree Company can trace their origins to an 18th century uh, grocery business, which was trading in some of the luxury commodities of empire of the day in coffee and tea and cocoa things that would later become the products of increasingly industrialized processing and manufacturing and, and branding. It was Henry Isaac Roundtree who took over the Tuke family business in 1862, who by this time had been making their own brand of Tuke Rock cocoa. And he was joined by his brother Joseph 
in the business from 1869. And it's really Joseph, um, pictured here on this slide, whose legacy is most familiar to us today. And it was Joseph who oversaw the move of production from cramped inner city premises at Tanner's Moat to the Greenfield site to the north of the city, where, which he purchased in 1890. The new premises facilitated schemes intended to improve the lives of workers from a day continuation school to gardens, a swimming pool, a dentist and a library. As industrial manufacture of confectionery increased in scale, um, women workers became increasingly important, typically making up over half of the labour force on the factory floor. They were seen um, as particularly suited to this kind of industrial food production, uh, given their domestic responsibilities for food, and were often assumed to have nimble fingers capable of detail work, such as hand enrobing chocolates or hand piping designs onto chocolate assortments. As the Bantry business expanded from the mid 1930s with lots of the sort of innovative products that are so familiar to us today, like um, Kit Kat and Black Magic, employment opportunities for women expanded. Following the Second World War and the lifting of rationing, women workers were in still greater demand. And despite increasing um, automation of certain processes, um, management were agonizing over how to deal with a shortage of female staff in the 50s and 60s. In spite of recruitment problems in 1959, women still made up over half the York factory workforce. And these women were always paid less than men until the equal, legislation, equal pay legislation of the 1970s. But despite the significance of their labor to the success of Ranchi products, when I started my research um, back in the two th early 2000s, there was really very little written about women's lives at the factory. So the first stage of my research was to conduct um, 13 oral history interviews with women who worked at the factory uh, for many years. Um, often they'd gone straight from school at 14, like some of the uh, girls in this picture of new starters here. Um, and some women had worked on and off at the factory for around 40 years. Others had been employed as seasonal workers or part-time uh, workers as married women. And their narratives offered some insight into just the everyday realities of chocolate manufacture and thinking about how they worked with this very symbolically charged commodity of, of chocolate and confectionery. Women certainly did find pleasure in working with um, the chocolate and making uh, round tree products. Um, sometimes that was just about the, the process and kind of pride in their, in their skill. Alice uh, told me how she loved putting black magic into separate paper cups because she could just do them really quick. And you can see a woman here put, um, using their uh, paper cups before the vacuum formed packing. Women also gained pleasure from um, the appearance of the chocolate and, and the craft that was going in, even as they were maybe just piping or hand marking one line onto chocolates as they went by in a conveyor belt. They found a, a pride in that. And my, my grandmother, Lily, talked about, you know, it was quite artistic, really, doing that, being able to do that, and how it was never quite the same once machines had, had taken over that process. So there was a lot of pride in, um, in the work that was being produced and in seeing those in a you know, beautiful um, box of chocolates. Card box making uh, was another area where women were employed in, in numbers and my own auntie, auntie Jean was employed in card box for a number of years and was very proud of uh, the, the intricate and beautiful boxes that they were, that they were making. Um, and there were showcases in the factory and photographs in the Coco Wets magazine, the in-house journal for staff that you know, sh showed off some of the, the great work um, that was being produced. But, I found in a lot of the narratives that there were, you know, ambivalences too around around the the production processes, and and this quote, um, I think, sort of gives a bit of life to this this photo about the glue that was being used on the boxes, uh, and captures some of those tensions. Where Betty talked about how she used to love do those lovely big boxes with the lovely pictures on, but the glue used to go on your chest because it was only like a little Bunsen burner, and the glue was on the top of that all the time, and you used that for doing it, and a brush, and oh, it used to make you feel sick. So some sort of those tensions, I think, are really interesting um, in women's narratives. And certainly there was a sense that the work, um, especially with the use of increasing use of conveyor belts, was becoming increasingly monotonous. So instead of using the little um, paper cups, 
uh, women were using vacuum form sprays and just putting one sweet in, uh, as Alice said, all day, all day, all day. She really captured that sense of, of monotony. And the, just the increasing pressures, the scale, the scale of production um, growing and, and the increasing um, time pressures that women were under to work fast and to put more boxes in and outer um, to be able to get their piece rate. But I think one of the things for me that was interesting in looking at a, a chocolate factory, a confectionery factory, was in, in talking to women about their working lives, was what it was like to actually work with the chocolate. Um, and in one way, eating chocolate could be a way of defying some of the rules around women's everyday lives. Um, but it was also sometimes just hard to resist. Um, and this was uh, captured for me in... in um, a comment by Lillian, one of the women that I interviewed. I don't know if this will work. I'm just going to try and play it. She's talking about eating the little make weight chocolates. Um, this may or may not work. Let's see. Especially those little make weights. Those little make weights like that to make the weight up, you know. And um, they were so easy. But if you didn't want one to put it in, put it in your mouth, you know, and it was dairy box chocolate which was lovely lovely chocolate milk chocolate all milk chocolate dairy box and uh it was so easy to put it in your mouth and then put it back on the tray where you'd got to you know i don't know how well that came across but i think i loved listening to Lillian talk about you know just lovely milk chocolate all milk chocolate dairy box and just get that sense of just this delicious um product that they were working with and ironically, of course, factories were creating, you know, this um, ideas of irresistible chocolate uh, through adverts like the one um, that I've put on the, sh the slide here, the dairy box chocolates. So women did voice a real pride in their in what they were making, and and they expressed some disappointment at the increasing mechanization of that of that product. And this suggested to me a real immersion in and a knowledge of the of the production process, but it didn't usually extend to any sense of, of where the raw ingredients for those products might be coming from. It tended to be very focused on the end the end result. Um, so although Madge Monroe, a young worker in the 1930s, had, had uh, spoken actually on a, a radio interview about how newcomers at that time would, as she said, attend lantern lectures and see the history of a chocolate from start to finish and hear just in what parts of the world our cocoa beans are grown, where we get our gum from and what we use it for. Um, despite this introduction, women's daily position and daily work in the factory meant that they were often sort of circumscribe their view of chocolate manufacturer manufacturer and they were typically working apart from those women working with some of the raw ingredients like nuts um, and sorting those ingredients often women were working more at the end of of packing and decorating chocolates and almost like sort of finished product and, and ready to be sent out um for retail but one common thread in a lot of the narratives um of the oral histories of the women that i spoke to was there was a real um, moment of change which they identified, even if this was after their working lives. And this was the Nestle takeover in 1988. Um, and my auntie Jean talked about, you know, we didn't we didn't want it to go Swiss. We wanted it to keep it British. And Roundtree's is York or was York and sweets all together are York. We didn't want it to go foreign. And this got me thinking just about that real connection and, and that real, the, the felt connection of people for round, between Roundtree's and the city of York. Um, and as someone who's grown up here, you know, that made a lot of sense to me. I could it really um, understand that feeling of connection. But it made me think, you know, as a historian, I started to think more about that, about the Roundtree's connection to a, a particular place, to a particular city and, and what that reveals, but also what it might potentially be concealing at the same time. So throughout their history, Roundtree's employed um, a variety of distinctly local images, um, both in internal communications like the Cocoa Works magazine um, that I've put here, which was their in-house uh, magazine distributed to workers, or in their um, advertising, uh, like in the image on, on the uh, left-hand side of the slide. The Minster, especially, which I was walking past today and thinking, oh, I miss the Minster uh, when I'm not here. But the Minster, which is a symbol of the North, as well as of York itself, 
appeared frequently on and packaging and promotional materials, as did other signifiers of York and Yorkshire. And um, the bar walls and the minster um, are really key to a particular image of the old city of York. Um, and often this is a city which has been divorced from the more modern um, political and economic concerns such as industrialization, colonialism and decolonization. In this vision, York is a beautiful old city, untarnished, thanks in part to the Quaker industrialists and philanthropists by vast industrial developments, poverty, or in, in often uh, case, the taint of racism. And in the 1920s, uh, Roundtree advertising featured a character which really, I think, epitomizes their sense of connection to their home city, Mr. York of York, Yorks. And this portly white gentleman in a top hat and bow tie drew on ideas about a certain kind of Yorkshire masculinity, plain speaking, ever the gentleman, polite and chivalrous. With the plain York brand, the very plainness of the chocolate was linked to a manly Englishness and Yorkshireness. In the words of one ad from the 20s, plain Mr York is always the chocolate gentleman. So it very much symbolises the close connection that Roundtree stressed between themselves and their home city, their English city of origin. And the existence of Mr York, I think, is suggestive of the use of York as both a physical and imagined location by the firm in its marketing campaigns. But they did, Rantries did, I think, also engage in, in more complex and sometimes contradictory versions of the, of the city. They did engage with this idea of York as the self-proclaimed sort of second city of the realm, as an important city, second only to London. Um, things like the celebration of the coronation in 1953 allowed Rantries to really connect with a sense of, of royal imperial um, patriotism. And you can see here the, the workers leaving under the banner, long live the queen. Affection for the royal family and the imperial patriotism that signified was also a useful marketing tool for Rantree products on a national and international scale. And the company certainly placed great importance on the granting of the royal warrant back in 1899 as the ultimate endorsement of an adver advertisement for uh, the quality of their products. Rantree chocolate wrappers emblazoned with symbols of the monarchy were tangible visual reminders of an imperial royal family, the aesthetic figureheads of colonial industry. So royal connections were one way in which the Rantree firm were Im implicated in the nationalist and imperialist project. And women workers remembered with justified pride that their most elaborate chocolate boxes were going to royalty. So at times, Roundtree's created images of York as a sort of historic city untouched by industry, but they did also at other times acknowledge um, York's strategic place within the nation and within the empire. This was more about what the company sort of gained um, from colonial economics rather than about the benefits um, the company and the, con oh sorry, this is less about what they gained from the colonial economics um, and more about the benefits that the company and the confectionery industry brought to the city. The sale and later the manufacture of chocolate in York was made possible by so-called imperial discoveries and the labour of people in the colonies. Clearly, chocolate itself is not a Yorkshire product. So York, the walled city, has been anything but bounded. Imperialism created and later permeated the ancient city walls. So why growing up in this chocolate city had I never really given a thought to the origins of the cocoa used in the chocolate I so eagerly consumed? How had Roundtree's chocolate in all its various forms become so disconnected from its um, essential ingredient grown for so many years in British colonies? Although I think things have changed in the last 20 years, I still find it's often the historically distant stories of chocolate's imperial origins, especially the Spanish confrontation and exploitation of the Aztecs, which take precedent in narratives about the industry, rather than a recognition of cocoa producers in more recent times. The stories of sort of the old, the new world origins of cocoa tends to be what is recognized rather than a, a cocoa farming um, in more recent times. In my PhD, I had the opportunity then to take my research much broader beyond the labour history of women workers, beyond the city of York, to think about the chocolate commodity chain in a much broader sense. And I started to think about the Roundtree factory in York as a nexus for a global commod commodity, where the cocoa and looking at where the cocoa and other ingredients were coming from to arrive at this, at this city and how women were involved, not just at the city of York, but also at different stages, different points in that colonial commodity chain.
In the days of Henry Isaac Roundtree, cocoa beans seem to have been purchased from London and Liverpool markets, but there were early moves to become more directly involved with cocoa producers. Both Roundtrees and Cadbury's became owners of estates in the West Indies in the late 19th century, motivated as much by profit as by the welfare of cocoa workers. After an exploratory trip by Francis Roundtree and J.B. Morell in 1896, the company became the owner of estates in Jamaica and in Trinidad in 1899 for £9,000. These estates were largely unsuccessful, however, and seemed to have been up for sale by 1914. The West Indies were already declining in importance as cocoa producers, turning instead to sugar. And yet the archives show that Roundtree did still have estates in Dominica until the early 1930s. In contrast to the situation in later years, when much of the cocoa came from small holdings in West Africa, Roundtree ownership of these estates does clearly put them in a position of direct responsibility for cocoa workers. While most histories of Roundtree tend to pass over their involvement with the West Indies, there is some archival evidence to help us understand how the firm was involved. They do appear to be the owners of several estates, um, Blenheim, Picard and Moore Park, Bonny, Hatton Hall, Mount Jewel and Bois Sandel. There was also the Dover Estate and Vinery Estate in Jamaica. And plans illustrate that cocoa was not the only crop grown on these estates. Uh, it seems that limes and coconuts, for example, were also cultivated. We can find out a little bit about the people that were working on these estates. Um, it seems that a person called Hamilton Law MacDonald was appointed as the overseer, overseer of binary estate in May, 19, eh, May 1899. Um, and his origins are not clear, but it's interesting that his contract um, says that he must solemnly promise during the continuance of this agreement to abstain entirely from all intoxicating liquor or alcoholic beverages of any kind whatsoever. This kind of stipulation is not that surprising, given the temperance commitments of the Quakers, but it's not a clause that seems to be in any of the other um, agreements that I could find. And it may be related to assumptions about both class and race. Certainly, there were non-white overseers on the estates. J.B. Morell's 1929 report from Dominica noted on the Picard estate, for example, this is a quote from the, from the report, Winston, a coloured man who lives in and has charge of Tai Bay. A list of staff at the Picard estate includes Mr. Bruni, who in a move which immediately sets him apart from the other implicitly white employers is also given that racial signifier of colored. But aside from those in charge, I found no definite information concerning the labor force on the estates. The only figure I could find uh, for the Dominican estate of 1926 uh, was an approximate number given of, again, uh, from the report, so-called colored people employed per week was as being one to 200. And I also haven't been able to track down any details of their contracts and whether workers on Roundtree estates had ever been um, indentured, which was a system of contract labour which persisted until 1920. Women as well as men were certainly employed on cocoa production, um, as we can see illustrated in some of these um, images, although these are from um, just before Roundtree's actually bought uh, estates in 1899. Um, official company photographs of cocoa farming in the West Indies tend to show women involved in what sort of framed as the lighter tasks um, of cocoa farming, like removing and sorting cocoa beans um, from the pod, so scooping out those beans. And Indian women often feature um, regularly in, in sort of the official images that I've seen, especially ones in the, in the magazines. This might tell us more about the contemporary fascination with exotic um, so-called coolie women, though, than about the exact proportions of um, African descended and Indian women on the estates. So I really struggled to find any evidence of individual women's working lives um, in the West Indian cocoa industry. And certainly I didn't find anything that was directly relevant to Roundtree's. But there was a Wages Commission report in 1920, uh, which just gives us a brief insight into the lives of, um, of some of the individual women workers. Um, just to give one example, uh, there was a woman called Princess Wallace, uh, who was a labourer on Henry Estate. And it was said that she was married. She had three children, 15, 10 and six years old. And she did gathering, uh, weeding and general work. She earned 30 cents a day and her husband earned 50 cents. Um, she had previously earned 25 cents a day for weeding 25 trees and she worked six days a week. She provided her own hoe and her own cutlass uh, and she used one of these a year. 
So it just gives us some sense, like these these fragments of sources, give us a sense of women's significant roles in 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 the cocoa industry, in the post-slavery cocoa industry. And there's clear evidence of a gender, some gender division of tasks, but also elements of cooperation and, and sort of a suggestion of the limits of models, which tend to rigidly divide um, tasks on cocoa farms according to the tools or implements used. She was um, using a cutlass, for example. Interesting though, the cocoa produced on Roundtree Estates in Dominica was not used in the Roundtree factory at York, according to one of the sources that I found. The estates there were finally sold uh, in 1934. Although Rantry ceased to own estates in the West Indies, they still purchased cocoa when they could from the British Caribbean and from the South American region. And Rantry perceived the South American region to be producing high quality flavor cocoa. Now, don't quiz me on the science of cocoa. I'm not good for people here will probably know more about it. Um, Kay Haslinger from the purchasing department uh, discussed the flavors needed for black magic chocolates in the 1950s. And he said that what we do not want is the mild neutral flavor of West African cocoa. But there were other prejudices at work, I think. Um, the Romance of the Cocoa Bean, which was a Rantree publication from the 1940s, talked about how, this is a quote, the best qualities of cocoa come from the West Indies, South America and the East Indies, where the production of cocoa is largely in the hands of white planters. And I think there are um, ways in which the discourse of quality, so often employed by the firm, conveniently intersect with racial prejudices and colonialist economics too. Early Rountree involvement in the growing African um, cocoa trade was initially indirect, but very um, controversial. And people may have heard about this um, cocoa scandal already. There is a good book on this as well. Um, the so-called cocoa scandal of 1908 to 9 centered on the Cadbury firm, really, who sued for libel following accusations in the Standard newspaper that they knowingly brought cocoa grown by slaves in Sao Tome and Principe the fifth largest cocoa producers at the time. And this um, map uh, is from Henry Nevinson's study, a contemporary study at the time entitled A Modern Slavery, where he was showing, sorry, my this is show, showing on the web, but the uh, small islands um, where people were being taken from the mainland to work in cocoa. Roundtrees and Fry had certainly been buying cocoa from this region as well, and so were equally implicated in many ways. One of the Roundtree directors, J.B. Morell, in a notebook from the later 19th century, which was detailing the characteristics of major cocoa exporting countries, included a short but telling extract under the heading Africa. And he wrote, St. Thomas, uh, Santa Tome, an island situated just off uh, the West Coast, having Gucona, coffee, cacao and other plantations, cultivated to a large extent by Negroes undergoing a forced apprenticeship, end quote. This recognition that working conditions were not all that they might be did not stop Roundtree's from buying cocoa on the open market. The Quaker firms, though, did commission a report to investigate conditions of labour, um, but reached the conclusion that it'd be better not to cease buying immediately as this would end any influence they might have on working practices. And historian Catherine Hall has concluded that this was really in keeping was with the Quakers' anti-slavery stance, that they were just really difficult decisions that they were having to make about how best to influence what was going on in this region. But still, they continued to profit from cocoa chocolate sales. They didn't boycott Sao Tome and Prancy cocoa until 1908. And from that point, it seems that labour conditions were slowly improving, though, um, one scholar, Nat, wrote in 1920 that the mortality of the plantation labourers has generally been heavy. Um, clearly, conditions were still far from satisfactory. The early 20th century saw the West African countries of Nigeria and Ghana, then known as the Gold Coast, make startling progress in the production of cocoa. And by the First World War, they were emerging as the principal um, producers overtaking um, other South, South American exporters, for example. And in 1919, Roundtree's attended a conference with Cadbury's and Fry to discuss the situation. And it was this meeting that led to the founding of um, Roundtree Fry Cadbury Nigeria Limited, initially called Cocoa Manufacturers Limited. So the three companies um, seem to have equal shares in this enterprise, but its headquarters were at York. And Cadbury's meanwhile were really sort of looking after the Gold Coast um, side of things. So the basic remit of the agencies was to supervise the purchase of cocoa directly from producers, arrange for its transportation to the poor and ensure it was shipped safely to its final destination. 
So Roundtree's would now be engaging directly with colonial relations of production in West Africa. They were no longer distanced as they could be when buying cocoa just on the open market. In 1920, uh, Percival Howard Soiker was appointed trading manager for the RFC um, Rancho Fried Cadbury firm in Nigeria, and he was also to serve as the company's attorney in the colony. His assistant, also appointed that year, was Harold Noble. These two men seem to have been responsible for overseeing the entire operation in Nigeria at that time, um, and especially setting up the buying stations, which were positioned to supervise the purchase of cocoa beans in each region. They were certainly would have been working directly with Nigerian um, staff. On a visit to the colony in 1924, Mr. Iredale of RFC reported his misgivings about Mr. Noble as being, quote, rather harsh in his treatment of native labourers. But he was reassured by Mr. Soper uh, and he wrote, quote, from what Mr. Soper told me, Noble is much more tolerable since he has had his wife at with him. End quote. As for Mrs. Noble herself, she, quote, seems to have settled down very well and to like the life in Nigeria. So although I haven't found any evidence of women employed directly as um, RFC staff, they do seem to have been present in Nigeria as part of the enterprise. It's difficult to find evidence about less senior members of staff in the archives. And um, there seem to have been about seven or eight people um, over there, which correlates with the eight residential properties. And uh, you can see some of them here that I was able to trace. In his 1953 report, Blitz details 60 buying stations in Western Nigeria. Um, and by that time, there were about 10 members of European staff. So it seems that each probably had about um, six stations to look after. And certainly it would have been a time consuming job. Um, Blitz wrote that in the height of the season, this is a responsibility which occupies over 12 hours a day and every day without exception of the week. So the agents would have been traveling, visiting the buying stations and supervising um, the buying of cocoa. And there was certainly a racial and gendered hierarchy at work in the RFC agency. White male staff were supervising um, the cocoa buying stations, uh, but African staff were responsible for the day to day operations of each station. And from the wage statistics, we can see that ranchers are employing, in the words of the, of the document, native clerks, native drivers and native brokers. The problem is we can only see um, a collective sort of working out of those wages. We don't know what the individual wages might have been. Besides employing um, some Nigerian staff directly, RFC were also working with the producers of cocoa. Now, it was very difficult to judge exactly the nature of this relationship, but a study conducted in 1956 found that RFC was the only firm which, in the words of the report, made it the rule to buy at its own depots through salaried employees dealing directly with producers. Other buyers tended to go through an intermediary or middleman. And it, the study concluded that um, they were paying better prices for higher grade cocoa. Uh, and the report said that farmers learned from the firm of Routry Fried Cabri, which from the early 20s paid premium prices to farmers who would prepare their cocoa to a high standard and sell direct to the firm. But cocoa farmers were still vulnerable to changing global commodity prices. And the depression of the 1930s was particularly drastic. In 1937, the major cocoa buying firms entered into a market sharing agreement or pool, um, which prohibited competition between them. And this was an attempt by the buyers um, to ensure they would make some profit when they sold their chocolate in difficult world markets. But it was less good news for the farmers who blamed the pool for low cocoa prices. And I won't go into the details of it because I'm not very good at the, the economics side, but um, this kind of pooling uh, arrangement was really sort of um, cemented from the Second World War uh, and, and carried on in the post-war period with the formation of the cocoa marketing boards in the 1940s. Roundtree's post-Nigerian independence in 1960 presented the cocoa marketing board as a positive influence from their point of view. Um, it was said that the marketing boards pay the producers a guaranteed minimum price fixed in advance of the season, thus safeguarding the farmers against steep falls in world prices. And the boards build up reserves when prices are favourable and apply their funds to support the local price when world prices decline. And that's a quote from, a, um, from the Cocoa Works magazine of 1960. 
But in later years, rancheries themselves complained to the cocoa board that the quality of the beans was deteriorating. And I think there's much more work to be done on the exact relationship of rancheries to the cocoa marketing boards, both before and after um, Nigerian independence. So Rantry's reputation in Britain as an enlightened um, employer has often stemmed both from its industrial welfare policies, but also its local uh, philanthropy. Um, and Rantry's did, as a company, make donations to local organisations in Nigeria, such as the African Church. These tended to be small, especially by comparison with investment in philanthropic activities closer to home. Company publicity instead stressed the role of the cocoa economy itself in helping to improve the quality of life in these producing countries. And it was said that, quote, the worldwide trade in cocoa is playing an important part in the rapid advances now being made by the farming communities which produce its essential raw material, end quote. This rhetoric of social advancement for the colony was conveniently interlinked with encouraging a more efficient workforce and therefore with increasing profits for the company as a whole. Now, Kat will know more about whether I'm getting this <laughs> correct, but, um, the Joseph Rantree Social Service Trust did eventually extend their philanthropic work into Africa. Um, although Joseph Rantree had apparently stipulated that the trusts he established should concern themselves solely with Britain, it was claimed in the Cocoa Works magazine in 1967, and this is a quote from the magazine, that had JR been alive 50 years later, he would have been one of the first to recognise Britain's responsibility for the welfare and education of people in former colonial territories. Indeed, the solution of these problems was now directly connected with this country, end quote. Although little evidence survives of day-to-day -day relationships between the Rountree Fry Cubby staff from Britain and Nigerians, the workings of colonial commodity chains clearly put them into direct personal contact linking the people and places of the York factory to those of Nigerian farms in ways that I really hadn't thought about at the start of my research. Mr Spears, for example, a manager of gum buying in northern Nigeria in the 30s, described his experiences establishing a buying station there, where he went to pay his respects uh, to the Shehu and present to him the very attractive artistic casket, which had been specially made for him at York. So giving a gift from the factory of York to um, someone who was going to be making um, raw materials. And there are numerous photographs in the Cocoa Works magazine to commemorate visits by, for example, Nigerians um, to the factory. There's um, a comment in June 1953 in the magazine that, quote, some colour was provided at the Cocoa Works by the visit of Mr. Obi Sesan, who came clothed in his traditional Nigerian dress. And Obi Sesan was one of the directors of the Nigerian Cocoa Marketing Board. So we can only ponder what impact this visitor might have had on um, the women and men hard at work on the York production line. Did workers make a connection with the colonial commodity chain or was he just an exotic distraction from the task at hand? Studying the operations of Rantry Fry Cadbury in Nigeria highlighted for me the colonial dynamics of the Rantry business and the ways in which Rantry Fry Cadbury staff live these dynamics on a daily basis. But it told me little about the lives of the cocoa farmers themselves, especially of the women who were not directly employed by, by Rantries. So given the lack of, of sources, um, I decided to get the clearer sense of women's roles in the industry. I would go to Nigeria myself. And in 2002, um, with the assistance of um, two NGOs and a translator, um, I conducted some interviews in Nigeria uh, with women cocoa farmers. It was not possible to decide whether these women had ever produced cocoa that was used directly in round tree products, um, but I think it's, their experiences still helped me to understand a little bit more about the lives of women who may indeed have farmed cocoa uh, for round tree fry cabri. So I'm not I'm going to give a real detailed account of this uh, um, today. Um, what I really took away from speaking to women was, was that they were very much active participants in this cocoa industry, um, which is important given that Nigerian cocoa um, farming is often seen as, as something that only men um, do, and that's often what's written in the accounts that I was finding. So women themselves um, talked about their very early involvement in in round trees, uh, sorry, in cocoa farming. Um, and from as, a, as a children, they were very much already involved um, in helping with this very often family small scale farms or in working um, for other uh, friends of family farms. Um, 
And I like this point when I was thinking about consumption of, of chocolate uh, on the factory floor, I found myself gathering the pods, but was not quite happy because they could not be eaten. So I did not understand why we had to be working on them. So this is uh, Madame Celiati reflecting back on her um, childhood experiences. And I think also thinking back to what I was saying about the uh, experiences in the British West Indies and the fact that there probably wasn't a very strict division of tasks, um, however that might be presented in official publicity, women did talk about um, just really getting in and doing the work that was needed. Um, so although they might have um, talked about a, a certain level of division of tasks in that, um, say, Grace talked about women scoop better than men, men spray and weed better, they also talked about they just men and women can do the same tasks. So when it's needed to be done, um, women will get on and do those tasks as well. So they talked about a whole range of um, farming activities that they were very much part of. Oops. So the scope of, of my fieldwork here was really very limited. Um, I hope that it would provide some kind of sense of the connection between women at different points in the colonial chain. I certainly was not, and I'm still not, an expert in African history. Traveling to the cocoa farms of Nigeria did bring me though into a kind of conversation by a translator with women involved. They were at a very different point in the same industry which had employed so many of my own family. But it also brought home, I think, the real inequalities of that industry and the extent to which I've been a beneficiary of being born at a very particular geographical and temporal juncture in that chocolate commodity chain. When asked for their final thoughts after the interview, many women were keen to stress to me um, the need for continued development. And Chief Grace told me, quote, I quite appreciate your visit, but we really want to feel the impact by you conveying um, our problems so that people can see in any way to assist cocoa and food crop farmers. And Abigail similarly urged me, I'm happy about your visit, but make sure you relay our suffering situation to the people in developed countries so they can come and help us. Farmers are really suffering. The women I met were highly aware of the connections that should be being made, urging me to recognize my own responsibilities in both the cocoa chain and the research process. And this in itself is, I think, still quite confronting for me and I don't really feel that I've achieve perhaps what they might have hoped. Um, so I'm running out of time a little bit, but I'm very close to the end now, um, just in case Kat's about to text me. Um, so the final stage in my own research journey has been bound up with my own migration to Australia, following a journey undertaken by many Yorkshire folk in the past, um, including certainly several workers at Roundtree Hoadleys in um, near Melbourne, which is the uh, image at the top of this slide. Like many other confectionery firms, after, especially after the First World War, Roundtree's um, established manufacturing subsidiaries around the empire and former empire. And though I'm not going to explore this in detail now, it's another element of the colonial past of British producers, which I think is worthy of further research. Um, and the bottom picture is uh, of my own very fortunate walk to what is the site of the Cadbury uh, factory, which was established basically 100, 100 years ago in Hobart. Okay, so to wrap, to wrap up, um, from starting out on this project as very much a local women's labour history, I never imagined that my research would lead me to the cocoa farms of West Africa and to histories of British colonialism in which York was deeply implicated. I've come to think about my own home city in new ways, linking the local and the global in both chocolate production and consumption. It was and is, I think, confronting to realise how the chocolate industry in York is so deeply implicated in the economics of colonialism, to recognise that there were such unequal relationships behind the success of delicious products like Kit Kat. But I do think that bringing colonial history more into the history of Roundtree's as a company actually brings a much more rounded and richer picture of Roundtree operations. Roundtree's themselves, despite their obvious and celebrated local affiliations, did not shy away from the colonial dimensions of their industry, which provided the everyday context of their operations. And they did make interventions aimed at trying to improve some of the worst elements of exploitation, even if this did not necessarily challenge, challenge the underpinning structural problems of the, of the day. The Roundtree firm, particularly when under the direct leadership of the Quaker Roundtree family, did display a strong social conscience, though this was always accompanied by a strong business sense. And I think these two things were always intertwined rather than being seen as incompatible. This isn't to downplay, though, that the Roundtree firm actively constructed its own self-image as the responsible manufacturer, fostering the ideal of a paternalistic, mutually beneficial relationship with cocoa farmers in British colonies and former colonies. 
So just some up, things have really changed a lot. I think in the 20 years since my PhD, the working lives of women and men in the chocolate industry aren't, aren't I don't think, so, so hidden anymore. And there is more widespread attention to both the colonial legacies in British society, as well as a broader commitment to sustainable cocoa production in terms of both the environmental and human impacts. The random society themselves are very committed to engaging with what, um, I think as they put it really aptly, the uncomfortable histories of colonialism, which underpins the confectionery industry and its profits. Unfortunately, finding the sources to fully understand these histories is really challenging. Writing a history of chocolate um, which recognises both the exploitation and agency of ordinary workers, whether they were wherever they were positioned along the cocoa commodity chain, is fraught with both ethical and practical difficulties. And reflecting on my own research journey, I think this is so not something that can or should be done by a lone researcher and requires working in close partnership with all the various communities involved. Thank you so much um, for listening. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, wow, there's so much to explore here. Um, I think one of the key takeaways for me is about the research methodologies required for this work. Um, archival documents are central to it, but as you've outlined, they also offer a really incomplete picture, especially where those archives are located in Britain uh, and are from a white perspective or the company perspective. Um, and it was this re recognition that led you to conduct interviews with farmers in Nigeria. So I think there's a strong sense that oral history interviews are required here for further research as well. Um, great, okay, so we have about 20 minutes for a Q&A session. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to submit to Emma or anything you'd like to ask me about the ongoing work at the Roundtree Society in this area, or you just want to share your thoughts on tonight's topic from your perspective, um, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to, uh, to let us know. And uh, with some help from Jamie, we'll aim to answer your questions live. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of expertise in the virtual room. Yeah, <laughs> we can't see people. Great. While we wait, I might just put in Kat and say, yeah, I think you're so right about the methodologies. Um, oh, there's something in the chat. But yeah, and and, and just the, the sort of really frustrating challenge of that in terms of this, the, the chronological scope and that we just can't get um, oral histories from, from an earlier, earlier period as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's really challenging just to grapple with the geographical scope of this and um, to try and identify just the range of communities in formerly colonised countries who are, who are been involved um, historically off, across such a, a broad temporal scope as well um, but it sounds as though it was it was something that you kind of came to just during the course of your own project without necessarily planning to undertake oral history interviews in Nigeria in the way that you did. Yeah yeah very much so and as I said I felt very sort of un in many ways unprepared but also it that you can sort of shy away from these things and just not do them and and it was that yeah there was it's still I think even just going back to my feel a bit fraught about it because it's like yeah it, it was um it was tricky especially not being an African historian but I did think that making that that connection uh, was important for me in the project yeah I had a couple of questions come in now in the Q&A box um or oh, quite a few coming in now so Bruce Cadbury asks for Emma did any of the cocoa farmers you encountered in Africa or elsewhere have finance from shared interest uh does that mean sort of from cooperatives or um Bruce, do you want to um add any notes uh maybe a, a little expansion on shared interest in the chat box if you can I wonder if it's a specific kind of uh scheme yeah, it might maybe it's too economic for me to uh, no. I mean, there were lots of different ways in which um, the the women had come either to own their own cocoa farms or to be involved in in cocoa farming. Uh, and I think there were like some cooperatives and and things that people maybe more recently uh, in terms of how women were getting finance and things for loans um, to 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 fund economic activities. Um, yeah, economics is not my strong point, so. Okay, yeah, it's Bruce's shared interest as a UK-based provider of microfinance. 
Oh, okay. No, sorry. I don't know anything. I didn't come across anything um, about that. Um, okay. Um, Rhiannon asks, are you continuing with this research? What might you or someone else work on next? Um, you, I know, Emma, you, you're definitely working on, on this and taking it in your directions. And then, so if you want to answer first, and then I can talk a little bit about plans that uh, we have at the Roundtree Society and that the trusts might have as well. Yeah, thanks, Rhiannon. Um, yeah, I am going back to um, this, possibly, I'm, the the research that I've been asked to do is, is for with Liverpool University, the, sorry, the <laughs> Liverpool University Press, uh, and uh, in collaboration with Historic England, very much about the historic sort of um, the legacies of confectionery production in Britain more broadly. Um, and it will be more of, a, of an overview, but bringing together all the different, uh, a few different firms, so like Terry's, Cadbury's, Roundtree's, but also um, one of the London firms. And so trying to, I think, maybe consolidate this a little bit and think about what's what's common across um, the industry. And, and probably it will be quite focused on the British angle this time, but still with that recognition of what, how have these companies been telling corporate stories um how are those changing uh, in recent times um how is the heritage of the chocolate industry and confectionery industry recognizing or not um the kind of colonial history so i've really been enjoying a, a little busman's trip to um the york chocolate story i went back to cadbury world um just sort of looking again at those places and and even things like the, the new beautiful new terry's um liquor store cafe and, and the way in which they're using images of um workers and then sort of that, and even things like the new Roundtree development, how the photos are being used on that and what's sort of there and not there in those sort of um, modes of heritage, if you like. So that's where I'm going back to it with. Um, but Kat, I think there's so many interesting things happening with the society. Yeah, um, I'll outline briefly some of the work that we have forthcoming, specifically at the Roundtree Society. But um, we have also been working with the trusts, the Joseph Roundtree Trust and other stakeholders over the last two and a half years to draw up plans for future historical research. And we've encountered a, a number of obstacles in the planning process. Um, the, the scale and complexities of the research involved is something we've outlined and discussed uh, tonight. Uh, and the importance of identifying the right leaders and expertise uh, as well. So as, as you mentioned, there's a, a kind of definite need for um, academic uh, expertise in African history, at least um, in Caribbean histories, uh, South African histories and um, yeah, a, a kind of assembling a, a team of uh, academics who uh, can take this work forward in partnership with communities and non-academic uh, partners is a, a really significant challenge. So we want to ensure that the research that goes forward is academically rigorous, uh, that it's appropriately contextualised and that it's conducted with the involvement of people of colour as well. So um, that work is continuing and, and we'll give further updates as soon as we have them. Um, Stephen Pittam asks, are you aware of any direct connection between the uh, Satome scandal and the creation of the Roundtree Cadbury and Fry Company in Nigeria? And then... That's a really great question, Stephen. And I've never, I, I can't say that I've ever seen anything explicit that makes that, that makes that link. Um, I mean, I think there is that background of being more directly engaged being, I think that's that being able to buy direct from the cocoa farmers. I may, you know, I think maybe there would be that in the back of their minds that um, be buying from British colonial territories and, and having more of an influence directly rather than buying on the open market. But I've never seen it stated explicitly. It's a great, it's a great question whether we'd be able to see anything in that in the archives where it's actually reflected upon um, about sort of moving moving forward. But I do think that sense of being more directly um in control of the of the cocoa chain is probably increasingly important after um the South Main Prince um, scandal. Mm -hmm. You would hope that uh oh I sometimes reflect on where exactly these conversations may have taken place at, mm -hmm. uh, within the company and board meeting minutes would be an obvious place to go, but we don't have a complete picture of those unfortunately. So um the archival gaps uh are a, a, tr a tricky thing to navigate when it comes to questions like this. Um, as somebody has asked whether there is uh, evidence of intermarriage, European and local. Emma, do you have you come across anything along these lines? I think maybe it's talking about the RFC um, staff. So when I was talking about the women and the the wives that went out, um, 
I didn't see anything in particular. I mean, that's not to say it, it didn't happen. One of the um, documents that I was looking back on, I, I didn't go back to the original, but I think I was looking at um, some records that were actually talking about sh um, the trans transport costs. It's not quite the right word. The kind of um, travel costs of the wives who were coming out for the RFC staff. Um, so certainly I think those sort of eight to 10 people, it was more a case of families um, coming out to join them rather than a case of intermarriage, but I, that's not to say it didn't happen. And, and then the British West Indies context, um, I, yeah, I don't really, I suspect that would be more complicated in terms of, yeah, this, even just that category of, of, of color that, that's put into the uh, archive documents. Um, that's not an area that I've got a lot of specialism in. So not for the RFC staff that I could see, but that's not to say it didn't um, it didn't happen. I have a I've come across a particular example uh, in relation to the Roundtree Caribbean plantations, which I'm actually hoping to do a little bit more research into this. Um, and it will come under the forthcoming work that we're, we have planned uh, along this theme. So I'll um yeah, if you are interested in that question, we we ha I have found a specific example again through the Cocoa Works magazine um of a marriage between one of the ground tree managers on uh, yes. an estate in Jamaica and the owner of that estate who is of Indian heritage if you, yeah, if you remember, I know yeah. the picture that you're talking about it's come yeah. back to me now brilliant wedding photograph, yeah. Work. yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to looking into that a bit more because we've oh, had some initial, uh, initial things on uh, the ancestry site relating to Jamaica. That's amazing. Um, okay, Joseph asks, was Roundtree's approach better or worse than average for colonially-based corporations? As how does the Roundtree company's uh, approach to its colonial operations mm. compare to uh, contemporaries in the UK and maybe uh, within Europe as well? That was certainly worse. <laughs> um certainly worse um and I think um I feel like I feel like you know I mean just on the top of that, I think there was a book um which oh I forgot the name of it it's really good it's a, it's through Manchester University Press and it was talking about advertising and colonial policy so it was looking at how firms advertise their products and then what their sort of reputation was in the place where they were working. And I'm pretty sure it was um, the Leverhulme one, especially that had very bad um, labor relations. Um, I think also it's interesting when we're looking at West Africa because of that, um, it's not, a plant, they're not sort of, it's not a plantation economy. So it is dealing with sort of independent farmers. And I think that changes the dynamic um, slightly. Um, but yeah, I think for all the sort of, as I say, that sort of structural inequalities and, and someone very rightly has put in the chat that those sort of neo-colonial or um continuing deep-rooted inequalities in the in the commodity chain that carry on um i think um Ranchies was certainly yeah comparable to some of the other firms was doing better yeah i'll just pick up on uh cat's comments here about that so uh cat writes unfortunately there are no former colonized countries they're still colonized uh, and talks about reparations to colonized people um uh, which I know is something that the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust has been working on and continues to work on with a working group there. Um, I know we have some some uh, people from Quakers in Britain here tonight and that they, they have a working group um, who are considering what reparations might mean in relation to their histories as well. Um, I think Kat also has put, uh, yeah, she's asked, uh, said that there are no such thing as people of colour, only colonised and not colonised, so that the kind of contemporary legacies of colonization um, and de decolonization are very much still felt in these communities and we're, we're hoping to acknowledge that and, um, and investigate things further. Um, oh, Stephen Berkman said, shared interest is a revolving loan fund. So um, yeah, there's an interesting question to follow up there. Uh, John asked, did the situation change after independence, for example, with the Ghana Cocoa Corporation? Mm, I, yeah, I don't know so much about the Ghana Cocoa Corporation, but the um, the Nigerian um, Cocoa Marketing Boards post-independence um, will be taking um, control over that um, cocoa industry. And there are um, just, yeah, going back through my notes recently, that sort of, it, it does get really complicated in Nigeria because of what happens with oil as well. Um, so that sort of decline of, difficulties of, of the cocoa industry after independence especially in the 1970s um gets very messy um but yeah the the cocoa marketing boards become 
uh, owned by the sort of Niger run by the Nigerian government, but then there's still complaints about whether cocoa farmers are really getting what their dues in terms of that inequalities of just that of that commodity chain where the primary producers are always getting the worst deal really and the most sort of vulnerable to fluctuations in prices on the global market. Yeah, I believe there's some work has been done on uh Cadbury's as they operated on the Gold Coast and in West Africa, but um not so much work on Roundtree. So that's 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 an area we've identified for further research. Mm. Um, is, it, is it Roger Suttle's thesis on, on yeah, Ghana? Issue, um, but yes, focusing specifically on Cadbury and the Cadbury archives rather than any yeah. Roundtree activities um in relation to the colonial office there. Um Bob asks, uh, sugar is an ingredient in chocolate. Has the sourcing of this been investigated, especially within the sugar plantation industry? Yeah, it's a really good question. We've been focusing on cocoa and other ingredients, more ingredients have come up, gum, lime, coconuts, but um, what of sugar? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I know there's some work going on in Australia now around that, you know, the the basically the conditions of and wonder which sugar was grown in Aust in Australia. Um so I think there's a big project happening right now around that industry. Um, and I haven't done, yeah, I just didn't really go into where exactly where the sugar was being sourced from. Um, I don't know, Kat, whether you know about the archives, what, um, what would be possible there in terms of tracing the source of sugar over time? Uh, we did identify a period in, I think, between the early 1820s and then the 1830s um, when Roundtree as a grocery business was purchasing sugar on the open markets in mm. Liverpool and London. Um, but the, uh, the kind of the archival um, uh, investigating this archivally would be incredibly difficult, I think, just trying mm. to untangle the supply chains during that period of time. Um, sugar is kind of an open question from the 1830s onwards as well, because the work that has been done that we've identified has focused more on cocoa. So um, it's another investigative strand that that we uh, we could follow up. Uh, Jim asks, were Roundtree's relationship with cocoa farmers purely economic or were there cultural links too? Um, so I guess there's a question about kind of broader culture of imperialism. Uh, were, was the company promoting religious views? Um, were there links to empire and ideas on empire um, support for the mother country? Um, was there any particular engagement around supporting Britain at the time of the two world wars? Oh, that's a really good question. And I'm trying to think back to archivist stuff and what I've forgotten. Um, the, the little bit that I was looking at, um, when I was talking about the Joseph Rantry, um, I think it was the Social Services Trust in, in the 60s, I think it was talking about um, how JR would have been keen to kind of fund um, projects in former colonies. That was around a school in Botswana, I think, and it was talking that, and this is kind of post, yeah, post-colonial, but as I say, never really an end of empire, but um, that was linking actually the University of York, which again, ranchies have an, an impact in, and, and then the school in Botswana and drawing connections. But I'm trying to think, I mean, there was, I think, cultural, um, when you see uh, like the visits of JF Blitz to Nigeria and he's writing about that, you, you see that sort of, um, it's not just about the economics, they're interested in in Nigeria, in what's happening Um in Africa, but I don't know specific. I don't if I could be pinpoint anything specific, um, like that kind. Of, it sounds like you're sort of thinking about sort of mission work, or nothing like that. But I think broader, more broadly, they're culturally en engaged, and even those kind of links between people visiting and people coming to York and going out from York. I mean, that's about I think a cultural and a social exchange as well as a purely economic one, which is a bit of. I'm fudging the answer, but um, yeah, I think it is it is broader, but I'm just struggling to pinpoint a really good example um, for you. And, and nothing maybe really tangible or and I don't know, but maybe Kat, do you know anything around the... No, it just strikes me as you're talking that we have the Cocoa Works magazine as an example of the ways in which kind of imperialist, imperialism was uh, was reinforced within the kind of British context yeah. at the, the Haxby Road factory, but no, no equivalent, I guess, no equivalent archival sources for um, mm -hmm. for the West Indies estates, for example, or uh, particularly where, where Roundtree had a direct relationship, uh, more direct relationship mm -hmm. with people there. So, um it's a very good I mean, I'm thinking the, the, around the walls, I remember seeing a poster and I'm sure there's a poster about cocoa production during the Second World War. Uh, one of those sort of propaganda posters, um, kind of, uh, which shows cocoa farmers. But that is probably more of a Ministry of Food 
um, thing, which Cadbury's, I think, was involved in. But yeah, a, more of a Ministry of Food project than a specifically round trees one. Okay. Oh, so we're we running out of time here and we've got so many questions. Um, I, I'm going to try and answer at least a couple more. And I'm so sorry if you've written a question tonight that we can't answer. Um, I had anticipated this number of questions, so 20 minutes has not been enough to contain. We save the questions for, for us to read through <laughs> later. I'd love to be able to read them all. Yeah, well, we will be we will be saving the content of the chat and the Q&A. Um, so there'll be right. a to revisit them. Um, uh, Let's just double check. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Sue, Sue Mendes just briefly has uh, signposted to Jim Walvin's work on sugar, which I, I am aware of. Um, yes, it's a, a, a strand of work which is incredibly significant, but is, has kind of been overshadowed by a focus on cocoa so far. Um, Jean asks about whether fair trade features in procurement of materials currently or formally. Anything you've come across? So the, where does fair, fair trade fit into the pic, the broader picture here? Is it something, uh... There's some really good work by Teresa de Silva Lopez, who's another uh, who's a scholar at the University of York, and she looks a lot into the sort of idea of of um, fair trade and sort of ethos of fair trade, and looks at the um, chocolate companies. So that uh, I'm trying to think that would be worth um, looking at. Um, I think it is that sense of paying a fair, like dealing direct with the cocoa farmers as being a sort of form of more equitable trade because you're cutting out the middleman and paying more for better, better cocoa, um, which of course is problematic in other ways. But um, so I, I think there's there's a kind of ethos there. If that is that, um, I'm not sure if that answers your question very well. Um, but yeah, I think Teresa de Silva Lopez's work is really interesting on that. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just going to draw out a, a response here from Sue and uh, Sue and Clive. Um, I share Emma's worries as a former archivist at the Joseph Roundtree, uh, one of the Joseph Roundtree Trusts, interested in oral history. I surprised myself by recognising the Roundtree's philanthropy intertwined with economic agility and educational reasons for improvements for workers, but I overlooked the colonial aspects until they suddenly dawned on me. Joint work is essential for further understanding. Uh, there's something really interesting there about kind of uh, I think Catherine Hall write, writes about knowing and not knowing about you know actually how we uh, we set out on to, on research journeys and um, uh, you know the the, um, the kind of colonial contexts are there and we have a, a kind of half consciousness of them but it's not something that we uh, that kind of confronts us in uh, a most obvious way. I'm just I'm reading a lot of the comments which is so great. Um, yeah, thanks for your comments. I, mean, I have remembered the book. The book that I'm thinking of is actually called Imperial Persuaders. I think it's Anandi Ramamurthy. Uh, and she's a it's a really fascinating study um, of different um, industries. So uh, I think tea is one, I think soap, and um, I think coffee might be in there and cocoa. So it's, okay. yeah, it, it gives a good comparison. Uh, Anne asks, is there any sign of Nigerians setting up some chocolate production in Nigeria rather than only providing the raw materials? Um... I guess was, there was a what was the feasibility of an equivalent manufacturing uh, operation in uh, in Nigeria? I'm sure. Um, I think it's oh, I think it's Cadbury that had a a plant, but I think it was more a processing um, rather than the chocolate manufacturer. It was more of a sort of more of a processing thing, but I'm not 100 percent sure about that because um, I think that's one of the things I think about. Yeah, why not set? yeah keep the the profitable bit closer uh to the cocoa farms but i just yeah i don't know of anything particular no, i think oh, yeah. yeah i feel as though this is where um we benefit from uh more expertise in african history and um or history historians of west africa might be able to talk a bit more um about the yeah the, the kind of limitations that cocoa farmers faced in establishing mm -hmm their own manufacturing operations there i don't know even i mean i'd be interested to know if people know in terms of maybe some of those more recent um ventures where you've got um i don't know like small scale um chocolate manufacturing things i mean it might yeah i know i know when Ram when cabri's moved to australia and ranchers there's a lot of worries about the heat just the sheer problems of trying to manufacture chocolate in in a hotter climate um that there are sort of genuinely i think practical trickiness about trying to do that um so things like big air conditioning and things like that to keep the um the plant the factory cooler in order to allow the manufacture it's something that they struggle with in the 1920s uh gary craig um asks uh cocoa well he outlines some thoughts here cocoa growing in ghana and the ivory coast next door is largely concentrated in the southwest of the country 
Um, and we know that there are 250,000 children still engaged in slavery conditions in these areas growing and harvesting cocoa. In relation specifically to Nigeria, I wondered what the significance of the Emir of Kano was. When I visited Kano, it was a semi-desert area. I wouldn't have thought cocoa was grown there, but rather in the southeast of the country. What was his interest? The economy depended on groundnuts. Were they a key part of the production process? Um, and then he's also highlighted the importance of following up research into sugar. Um, yeah. So I, I do. You, I, I believe Nigeria was a focus because of the exploitation of gum arabic in that region. Is that right, Emma? Yeah, I think definitely it was gum, um, gum not not cocoa from that region, um, but then groundnuts as well. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was. It wasn't the cocoa, as you say, from that um, from that particular region. Cocoa was yeah southeast. Right. Okay. Yeah, gum was mentioned. I think is that the is that the source we're thinking of? Was the was the gum? Yeah, I know that uh, gum. Um, so part of the forthcoming work that we'll I'll outline just briefly before we finish in a second it was um, it relates to uh, Benjamin Seabem's around Benjamin Seabem Roundtree's trips to colonial Nigeria in the nineteen thirties to develop the gum arabic industry there. Oh, great! It yeah, been, yeah, it could have been gum. Um, I'm so sorry we're not going to have time to go through all of the rest of these questions. We're meant to be finishing. Uh, we're meant to have finished already. Um, but we will uh, hold on to these questions as well. Um, and I'll in a, just a second, I'll share the ways that you can get in touch with us. So if you did have a question tonight that you wanted to follow up, um, you can email us or uh, get in touch with us via uh, one of our social media platforms. And we'll, we can perhaps do our best to answer them. Um, Emma, I don't want to retain you. Uh, we want to keep you on a retainer to answer these questions but yeah, um, <laughs> if, yeah if anybody really does have a burning question then um, please do get in touch and we'll do our best to um, to get back to you um, Jamie has just put some um, links in the chat box there by way of follow-up tonight um, to uh, various um, social media accounts that we have we've put we've got a link to the original statement on Roundtree colonial histories from April 2021 and to Emma's book um which was the uh, which was where she's written up all of the research that she shared tonight um I will just very briefly share with you um a couple of the uh, areas of work that we have um planned for the forthcoming months uh so this is how you can get in touch with us. Our website is www.roundtreesociety.org.uk. Uh, you can get in touch via the um, email account, info at roundtreesociety.org.uk. And the best way to keep in touch with us um, in relation to future events is to sign up to our e-newsletter. Uh, Jamie's put a link in the chat box, but you can also uh, add your details in the sign up box at the bottom of our website homepage. And in the coming months, we'll be looking at a few areas around this research theme. Um, there'll be more on round trees, caribbean plantations. Um, Emma's touched on these today, but um, the round tree company purchased plantations in purchased and unleased plantations in uh, Jamaica and in Dominica in the 1890s and retained the plantations in Dominica until the 1930s. We'll be looking at the role of the extended Roundtree family in the Boer War at the turn of the 20th century. And as I've just mentioned, um, we'll, be also, we'll also be undertaking some research into Seabone Roundtree's trips to Nigeria in the 1930s in relation to the gum Arabic industry there. Thanks uh, so much everyone for joining us tonight. Um, Thank you so much, Emma, uh, for, for giving us your time and for answering so many questions. Um, we really hope to see you again soon at a forthcoming event.